clarity to the situation there. All right. Very good. Very good. Very good. So, we are counting the Omer. We are still counting the, uh, the, the Omer. This 50-day period from Passover to Shavuot. Uh, isn't it interesting that we always say Passover to Shavuot rather than Pesach to Shavuot, right? We use the English for Passover, but the Hebrew for the Feast of Weeks. It's kind of interesting. All right, because Shavuot means weeks. It's literally what it means. Think about that uh, when we get there. But the journey is really an important one. Uh, the journey from uh, a Passover to uh, Shavuot, as we know, is uh, a, a very important time in, in the Jewish community and, the Lord willing, in the, in the Messianic Jewish community uh, a, as well. As we look forward, remember we talked about that? Looking forward from Passover, uh, you know, uh, from the redemption out of Egypt, parting of the waters of the Red Sea, to, uh, uh, to uh, Mount Sinai, right? Uh, I, I, in, in another uh, way of looking at it, it is um, uh, moving from one redemption to the next redemption, right? From the first exodus to the second exodus, from the first Moses to the, to the consummation, right? And then, of course, historically, uh, uh, when we think about Yeshua, uh, from uh, the resurrection of Messiah to a uh, Pentecost, or what we read about in Acts chapter 2. Generally speaking, most people understand what I mean when I say, when I say that. The pouring out of the Ruach, the pouring out uh, of the uh, Spirit. And it's always a journey. It's, you know, it's a journey. It's a, a time of, uh, of uh, growing, a time of uh, digging deeper. And it's interesting that if you look in the uh, New Covenant Scriptures... I, uh, perhaps some of us are familiar uh, with this. Oh, look, here's the announcements. I just found them. All right. So let me just say, first, there's still time to join uh, Joel Willits. Oh, never mind. We did it already. Okay. All right. I just thought I'd do of the... Uh, I just want you to know I haven't completely lost my mind. Only about half. Okay. Uh, so... It's interesting when you look in the uh, Brit Chadashah, when you look in the New Covenant Scriptures, what was Yeshua doing during, during that period of time? From, literally, from the resurrection to uh, uh, Shavuot, when uh, the Spirit was poured out. What was Yeshua doing? Right? Well, we don't have a 40-day account, just like we don't have a three-and-a-half-year account. We don't have a diary of what Yeshua did every day. Uh, for his whole ministry. We're reading highlights. We're reading just, you know, highlights of what he said, highlights of what he did. So we also are fortunate to have highlights of uh, what Yeshua did and said during that uh, period of time. Remember, it's divided up into 40 and 10, right? He was with his disciples for 40 days after the resurrection. Then he ascended uh, to the right hand of the Father, and then it's ten days later that we see the manifestation of Yeshua at the right hand of the Father with the pouring out of the Ruach. Well, we could turn to a several different places, but I want us to look uh, at uh, the, gospel of, uh, the Gospel of Luke. It's in chapter 24. Okay. I'm going to read a little bit of it here. All right. Here we go. Yes. Luke chapter 24. So that's where, you know, we read about the resurrection and we read about the empty tomb and, and we read about the, you know, the, the women coming to the tomb and the tomb is empty and the angel is there and tells them that he's risen. You know, he is, he's risen from the dead. And then there's some confusion, right? Uh, they, they can't believe that he rose from the dead. Did somebody take his body? Uh, Peter goes and checks it out. Uh, and then we come to uh, a little section here where we have two of uh, the followers of Yeshua 
uh, on their way to a little town called Emmaus. Right? We love that. We, how many, the road to Emmaus. Right? There's a lot of, a lot of sermonizing on it, even names of conferences and, and everything else. It's all good because it was an important little journey. Uh, but not only the journey, but also uh, what Yeshua does. So it says here in verse 13, And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were conversing with each other about these things which had taken place. And it came about that while they were conversing and discussing, Yeshua himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking, looking sad. Okay? Looking sad. And one of them, by the name of uh, Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which are happening here in these days? I find that to be, it almost puts a little smile on my face. Uh, you know, he, he's saying this to, uh, you know, to, to Yeshua unrecognized, right? Oh my goodness, right. Uh, and he said to them, what things? So he wants to bring out of them what's, you know, what's, what's going on. And they said to him, the things about Yeshua the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, in the sight of God and in all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him up uh, to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it's the third day since these things happened. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So what we see is, after the resurrection, Yeshua finds his disciples confused and disappointed because they did not understand his mission. They were confused and they were disappointed. He did not meet their expectations, right? Uh, he, uh, uh, they thought he was going to defeat the Romans. He's going to, you know, do all the things that uh, we hear that the Messiah is supposed to do, right? Uh, and here, it seems like he's defeated. It seems like, in other words, like he lost. Like, you know, uh, he's dead. Something uh, is not adding up. And notice it says they were sad. They were sad. Okay? They also notice uh, what they say here, uh, that uh, he's a prophet, mighty in word and deed, uh, and, uh, and he was crucified, and we were hoping that he was going to redeem Israel. Uh, and so... Uh, they, uh, they are dejected, and, uh, and, they are, and they are sad. But when we go down a little bit further, now we see here uh, that he says uh, to them, O foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Messiah to suffer these things? and to enter into his glory. Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning uh, himself uh, in all the scriptures. Now, a little bit farther down, in verses, uh, if we move farther down, I, I will, I guess I'll read uh, this part here. In verse 33, so it says here, uh, oh, I, no, don't have time. Okay, so in verses 44 and 45, a little farther down, he is uh, speaking, uh, he is again uh, speaking to them. Now they recognize who he is. He's revealed himself. Uh, he's revealed himself to them. Uh, you know, he, he shares a meal with them. 
uh, he, uh, he demonstrates that he really has risen from the dead and that he has a real body. Uh, and he eats, you know, with them, and he's having fellowship with them. Uh, and so now they recognize it. So now he says this, though, in a sense reiterating a little bit of what was said earlier, but now maybe expanding on it. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds... Uh, to understand uh, to understand the scriptures. Okay. Now it's interesting. The following verses kind of explain what it is that he said in summary. Thus, it is written that the Messiah would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth my promise, the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So you see, he says there's three things that he, that he basically says. The Messiah would suffer, the Messiah would rise, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his, in his name. Okay? And he roots all of this in the Tanakh, uh, in, in the scriptures. Yeshua makes himself known uh, to them. They have a meal, and he explains that he came to suffer, rise from the dead, and empower the message of repentance to the world. Uh, if you read, beginning in verse, uh, really, 13, uh, to the end of uh, Luke chapter uh, 24, you can read about this meal, and you can read about how he, he uh, actually reveals himself, uh, and then how he actually ascends, how he disappears. Now remember that Luke not only wrote Luke, but he also wrote Acts, right? And uh, the beginning of Acts picks up right here, right at this point, at the end of uh, Luke 24. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 4, we read, Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, You heard from me. For John baptized you with water, but you will be immersed or baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring the kingdom to Israel? See what 24 uh, was that, that sad disappointment, right? And that is what Luke is bringing out, that, that uh, it wasn't only, uh, you know, this uh, disciple that, uh, you know, that, that, we don't, that we don't hear too much about, but all of them uh, were in a quandary. All of them uh, uh, were confused uh, about uh, the mission of Yeshua, okay? Uh, and so he responds. He says, at least now here in Acts, right? It is not for you to know the times or epochs by which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. So if you go back to uh, Luke 24, remember uh, that uh, he says there that uh, he, came, he taught them that he came to suffer, to rise, and that the message of repentance and forgiveness would be proclaimed beginning in Jerusalem. And he taught them from the Tanakh, right? From the, uh, it says, from Moses, uh, the prophets, and the Psalms. Now, uh, what's really interesting uh, about that, that is the whole Tanakh. Uh, when he says Moses, it's kind of shorthand for, you know, the law of Moses or the Torah, uh, Genesis to Deuteronomy, right? Uh, when he says the prophets, he means, in Hebrew, the Nevi'im. 
Now, the prophets in the Hebrew Bible is understood to include uh, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. So it includes what we call the historical books plus all of the prophets, right? And then the Psalms. The Psalms is shorthand for the rest of the Bible, the rest of all the books, right? Which includes all, you know, uh, the, um, the poetry, the wisdom literature, the later history, and all the books that are, uh, that are, that are uh, said on holidays, which is, which is very interesting. And it's simply called Ketuvim, or writings, which means like everything else. Uh, you know, uh, Torah is very specific, Nevi'im, very specific. Ketuvim is like writings, other, other things. Uh, just so you know, uh, the uh, writings include First and Second Chronicles, which is the very last uh, books uh, chronologically of the Hebrew Bible. That if you have a, a Jewish Bible, which means uh, either in Hebrew or in English, but published by a, by like uh, you know a, a Jewish uh, company, right? Uh, First and Second Chronicles is at the very end. Uh, also, just so you know, Daniel is actually included in the third section of the Hebrew Bible. If you want to know more about any of that, take an MSI class. Uh, I am sure um, uh, you'll be able to learn uh, all, all about it. So we call it the Tanakh, right? We use the word Tanakh. It's a made-up word, right? It's a made-up word. Tanakh it stands for Torah, Nevi'im, Ketuvim. So don't worry about how to spell Tanakh, okay? Uh, you know, as, as long as you have the T, the N, and the K in it, you're doing all right, all right? Uh, and uh, be, uh, for tradition's purposes, uh, you want to make sure that they're separated by A's, all right? <laughs> okay, there you go. All right, so the whole Tanakh uh, points uh, uh, to the whole ministry of Messiah. I'm going to suggest that Yeshua wasn't just pointing to, you know, messianic pr prophecies that God fulfilled when he came, okay? But that you have everything here. The whole Tanakh points to the need for substitutionary atonement. What we read about in Leviticus, that animals had to die so people could live, <laughs> basically, right? Uh, a priesthood. Uh, in Leviticus and in Psalms. In other words, you needed a, media, a mediator. You know, um, uh, I love to tell this little story uh, when this comes up, that a long time ago, I remember meeting with a Jewish man, uh, and, uh, uh, and he said to me, he said, you know, the problem I have with you people is I don't need Yeshua. I go straight to God. You know, I go straight to God. I go right to the boss. So my first response was, how do you know the boss will see you? I mean, that's from your end. You're, uh, how do you know? And then I pointed out to him that he must be better than Moses. He must be better than David. He must be better than everybody because nobody could do that. Right? Right? A mediator is necessary. A priesthood is necessary. Where do we read about that? We read about it in the Torah. We read about it in the writings. We read about it in the Psalms. And clearly, we read about it all the way through. Uh, the promise, a, a promise of forgiveness, a new life, right? Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And I'm pulling these. You can read about these things in lots of passages. The promise of a suffering servant. There's four specific passages in Isaiah. Not only Isaiah 53. Uh, 42, 49, and 50 also, right? Whoa. Uh, the, promise of a, uh, the promise of a messianic king. Psalms, prophets, Torah. Who can forget Genesis 49 or Psalm, uh, you know, Psalm 2. Or the end of just about every single prophet, <laughs> you know, who talks about the, the, the coming messianic uh, king. Even the latter prophets, meaning Zechariah, very much in particular, talks about God 
coming and ruling on his throne and nations coming to Jerusalem. That is a very interesting, that is a, a very interesting truth. And then a promise of the Holy Spirit coming, Joel uh, and Ezekiel. Now, something that we, um, that we want to uh, understand about this is that when you look at the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, it's kind of like a pyramid. I like to look at it like a pyramid. Now, of course, it would have been great to have a nice slide of, of a pyramid that said Torah, prophets, and writings. So you got it in your head? Torah, prophets, and writings. And that is that the prophets... While God gave them, it's God, the God-breathed word, clearly, and that God gave them revelation, they had, a, uh, they had an informing theology, we'll call it. They had an informing text that helped them to frame everything that they wrote. And that text is the Torah. They build on the Torah. They take the words of Torah and then give more information that God gives them. And then when you come to the writings, in some of the places, uh, in the Psalms in particular, there's, it's teased out even more with more information. Uh, and so that it's not as if you have the Torah and truths taught there, and then a whole different set of truths in the prophets, and then a whole different set of truths in the writings. They build on the base. The base is the, is the, uh, the Torah. And then the prophets uh, and the writings. Basically, what the prophets are doing is preaching the Torah to the people. Really, that's what the prophets are doing. They're preaching the Torah. Repent. Repent of what? Well, all these things that we read about. I don't know what's happening. That we read about in the, uh, that we read about in the uh, uh, Torah. Uh, and then what the writings often do is bring poetry to it, uh, to the very same, uh, the very same uh, 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 truths. Uh, but it's the whole Tanakh. And I would suggest that Yeshua wasn't just cherry-picking verses like we sometimes like to do, but he's pointing out the fact that, the whole, that all of it points to him. It's the, it's the divine, by divine design, he had to come and he had to die and be raised from the dead. Uh, and so that this is not something new. And he had said these things, right? Uh, and he brings them to mind now that he's teaching them after the resurrection. But he also points out from the, from the scriptures. The entire Tanakh looks to the future redemption. The whole thing. The calling of Israel, the failure of the nation, looks forward to a consummation of promise. For example, the, wil the, the, wilderness, the wilderness wanderings, uh, all, of the, uh, all that we read about, you know, in the book of Numbers, in the wilderness wanderings, points to the need for the anointed one, for the Messiah. The failure of Moses to enter the land points to the need for another Moses. Uh, Moses writes this himself, right? In Deuteronomy chapter 29. God, with all that you've given them, you haven't given them eyes to see, ears to hear, or a heart of understanding. And in Deuteronomy chapter uh, 30, we read about, you know, he's going to circumcise your heart. He's going to, and, you know, he's going, to, he's going to give you, he's going to empower you to live out the Torah. All looking toward the, uh, all looking toward the, the future. And, uh, and I would suggest that this is what Yeshua is, is teaching them, that all of this is rooted in the, in the, uh, in the Tanakh. And, um, you know, I think I mentioned this recently, I'm not sure, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Paul gives a great example of this where uh, he's not talking about a messianic prophecy, but he's talking about the history as we have it in the Tanakh. And so he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and were all immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Messiah. Uh, nevertheless, 
With most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. These things happened as an example for us, that we should not crave evil things as they uh, craved. And then he uh, goes on and, and talks about this. And then, but then he says, but these things, in verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. But the point I wanted to uh, emphasize is what he says at the very end of the verse. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So I would say, Paul, just like the rest of the apostles, and what Yeshua was teaching is that upon you the ends of the ages have come. All that is written about me is, is, in the, uh, is in the Tanakh. And now is the beginning of the consummation. Now is the beginning of the new age. There was not a new covenant scriptures yet. The scriptures had now come to be fulfilled. Right? Now we know that the, the, the question of the disciples about Israel, we know that... It Good question. Their confusion was, uh, is understandable, right? Because the, uh, the redemption of Israel is part of the messianic promise, right? And we know that it's the beginning of the consummation. And that is why we have a new covenant scriptures, because we're not at the end of the, of the uh, 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 consummation. But there is this Tremendous continuity, as we all know. Now, you know, because Luke wrote the book of Acts, Acts gives us a hint of the kinds of things Yeshua actually taught. The reason I say I use the word hint and kinds of things is because if you read Peter's speech in Acts chapter 2 out loud, how long do you think it would take you? Three minutes? I'm guessing that he spoke for longer than three minutes, right? So the point being is that what you read about the speech is not everything he said. That Luke's giving us some highlights in all these speeches, you know? And that is true, by the way, everywhere. You know, when Yeshua gave the Sermon on the Mount, it didn't take him 10 minutes, right? I, you know... I, uh, I would suggest that uh, Yeshua and the apostles are, as someone once said, long talkers. Okay? And I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Uh, so Peter's, uh, Peter's sermons were longer than the text we have. But we do have some highlights. Right? So Joel 2. Uh, 28 to 32, talks about the pouring out of the Spirit. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2, 17 to 21. Psalm 16, 8 to 11, the death and the resurrection of Yeshua. Acts 2, 25 to 28. Psalm 110, the priesthood and king, that should be kingship of Messiah. Acts 2, 34. Deuteronomy 18, 15, a prophet like Moses. Yeshua is a prophet like Moses. Acts 3, 22. Genesis 12, 3, the blessing of the nations coming through Israel. The calling of Israel. Acts 3, 25. Psalm 2, the anointed king. Uh, Acts 4, 25 and 26. And chapter 13, 33. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Acts 8, uh, 32 to 33. Additional scriptures that Yeshua taught during his life. Remember that what we read is when, Yeshua, when Luke is writing that Yeshua taught them from the scriptures, they said what he said and from the scriptures. He reminded them what he had said during his ministry and from the scriptures. So during a Yeshua's life, what's very interesting is that he really emphasizes he emphasizes his suffering, that he had to suffer. In fact, you can do this on your own. Uh, if you uh, have a concordance, depending on your translation, I guess, if you look at the word necessary, it was necessary, that Luke says this more than once, 
that it was necessary that he should suffer. Or Yeshua says, it was necessary that I suffer. There was clearly this clear understanding of his mission by himself. And then after the fact, by Luke and Paul and Peter and the apostles. Yeshua emphasized his suffering. Here are just some of the passages. Luke 9, 22 and 23. Matthew 16, 21. Luke 9, 44 and 45. Luke 17, 25. The Matthew 16, 21 passage is kind of interesting because it talks about a, a long period of time. From that time, Yeshua, <laughs> Yeshua uh, began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and to be raised up on the third day. So he began to show his disciples this. It wasn't like a one-time thing. You know, it wasn't like they, you know, they're, they're racking their brains. And thought, oh, that, remember that one time Yeshua told us that he had to die? No, this was part of his main discipleship of the apostles, preparing them for the, for really the hallmark of his life. Preparing them, preparing them. But they did not get it until after the resurrection uh, and he explains it. And then, of course, there's a real change in Peter from uh, the Gospels to Acts, right? Now he is, he is at the forefront uh, and he is the one quoting all these passages that point to Yeshua from the Torah and the prophets and the writings. Right? Okay. So Yeshua's mission was designed by God and foretold by Moses and the prophets and reiterated by the, uh, you know, by the writings. So for us, when we embrace the Messiah, we become witnesses we become witnesses uh, uh, to, uh, to, the, uh, to the world. You know, there's a, there's a great passage uh, here in, um, in Acts 5. Peter says this after a prison experience. The God of our fathers raised up Yeshua, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and savior to grant repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Ruach HaKodesh. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. So all of us are recipients. When we embrace Yeshua... We are recipients uh, of the Ruach HaKodesh. Uh, we now become connected to the resurrection of Yeshua. And we become uh, witnesses uh, of, of forgiveness and of repentance and of resurrection life. How do we do that? How do we do that? We do that in a number of different ways. One is to testify of the truth of Messiah, that we have been forgiven. Let us not get the idea that, that unless uh, we're saying that Ye Yeshua gave us a million bucks or healed us of every disease, that it becomes irrelevant, whatever we say. No, we need to recognize that the forgiveness of sins uh, is a reality uh, and we have a whole new way of viewing the world uh, in, in Messiah. Uh, our hope is in him. Uh, just like if you remember last week uh, when we were uh, talking about being distressed. Remember that? You know, in the very same, uh, in the very same passage, uh, a little farther down, uh, we read uh, we read this in uh, uh, chapter one. Okay, I'm stopping in a second. Okay, uh, I, uh, that uh, in verse ten, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace uh, of the grace that would come 
to you, made careful search and inquiry, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Messiah within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of a, uh, as he predicted the sufferings of Messiah and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you uh, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These things which angel, angels long to look. Therefore, he's saying, you've received this. You, have, you know, this is what the prophets were looking for. This is the, you know, what the, the Tanakh is looking forward to. Therefore, you've received it. Therefore, gird your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you in the revelation of uh, Messiah Yeshua. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy. Right? Okay. Uh, I think I'm just going to stop there. All right. So, during this season of counting the Omer, uh, let us count the costs. Let us count the costs of being a Messiah follower. Let us be sure that, that uh, you know, we are walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which he has given us. Uh, let us make sure that we understand the mission of Yeshua, which helps us to navigate through all the great difficulties uh, in, uh, you know, in life. Uh, and uh, recognize uh, that, uh, you know, they were disappointed because of what uh, Yeshua I evidently did not do. But remember the great words of, uh, of Habakkuk. In a way, this is what Yeshua has done, right? The vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it certainly will come, uh, and, uh, it will, uh, and it will not delay. And so that's where our hope is. That's what keeps us going. That's what keeps us filled. That's what keeps us empowered and not sinking in the quicksand. That our hope is not in current events and our own lives are in the world. Though it tarries, wait for it. Yeshua is indeed, uh, is indeed uh, uh, coming back. Uh, and uh, what's so interesting here is that uh, for the apostles here, they're waiting and they're, they're waiting. And what happens when Yeshua disappears? It's not that he returns and, uh, you know, and, and finishes, finishes the, the entire, uh, the completion of the plan of God, but he sends the Ruach. He sends the Ruach. And here now they are empowered. And now Yeshua continues to live through them. And now they are fulfilling their, their calling as witnesses. When we receive Yeshua, we are empowered. May we live in that calling. Uh, may we be a light in the midst of darkness. And as we prepare for Shavuot, may it be a time of reflection, may a time of renewal, uh, and, uh, of, uh, and of understanding uh, these, uh, these great things. Let's pray. Lord uh, God,